Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new Redefining Security podcast. Have you ever thought that we are selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Perhaps we are. So let's look at how we can organize a successful InfoSec program that integrates people, process, technology, and culture to drive growth and protect business value. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Pentera, the leader in automation security validation, allows organizations to continuously test the integrity of all cybersecurity layers by emulating real-world attacks at scale to pinpoint the exploitable vulnerabilities and prioritize remediation towards business impact. Learn more at pentera.io. Hello, everybody. This is Sean Martin, your host of the Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast here on the ITSB Magazine Podcast Network, where, as you know, if you listen to the show, I try to unpack uh, security risk and policy and all kinds of fun stuff as it impacts our business and hopefully doing it in a way that we can uh, enable business in a secure fashion. So uh, get ahead of get ahead of the threat, reduce the exposure, make some good decisions in the beginning. Uh, to to really uh, drive that revenue and and protect it on the other side, and as you know, or probably kind of guess, uh, technology is in no way, shape, or form slowing down. Uh, we see it in, in the form of AI uh, most recently, but there are a number of things that are hitting businesses, giving them an opportunity to expand and grow and reach new customers and give them new whiz bang shiny uh, flashy things and. Uh, with that uh, comes networking and connections and communications and data and and all that to me uh, says exposure and risk. So we're going to kind of pull all of those things together and uh, I'm going to do that uh, with somebody who's been on the show before with uh, my co-founder Marco and they, they got into a more, uh, let's say, philosophical discussion around society and technology and I, and I believe there's a little bit of cyber in there as well. We're going to take a look at this uh, this topic a little more from a business perspective. And Tron, big, great to have you on the show. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks I'm excited. For yeah, excited to be here. Thanks. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. And uh, it's enough rambling for me. I want to hear you hear all the fun things you're involved with. And before we do that, so of course, I'll, I'll put a link into the other episode that you had with Marco so, so folks can listen to that. But uh, I want people listening now to know a little bit more about who Tron is and uh, what you're up to. So a few words from you, if you wouldn't mind to kick us off. Sure. Uh, Sean, I'm a futurist. I work on the future of technology and society more broadly, but also very specifically on risk issues, uh, significant risk issues. I work on the biggest uh, issues there are that are threatening our civilization. But I also, to your point and to your show, I, uh, you know, I'm a businessman, so I work on the, uh, Issues that enterprises can uh, protect themselves with in, in the here and now. You know, uh, whenever you talk about risk, it's important not to get stuck in the future. We we all know very little about the future. That's the challenge, right? So it's very important to figure out how, how to get there and how to get there safely. And, uh, you know, um, I work at Stanford as a research scholar, work on risk and innovation and also policy issues and mitigating risk very importantly, right? It's not just about describing what, what the problems are. It's about coming up with business and, and governance strategies. So that's what I do. And then obviously uh, do some other things. I, I have a podcast, Futurized. Um, I uh, run uh, you know, some consulting and I do a lot of speaking uh, my, all around the world. So I love it. Well, it's an, it's an honor to have you on. And I can't help, as I was saying my stuff and as you were describing some of the, the work that you do, just how vast and, and broad uh, the topic of technology is and the impact it can have on, on society and all the things that, that make society work from government to 
commercial enterprise to us as individuals. And you have a book behind the augmented lean, which is to me, <laughs> the, the opposite, right? How, how do we trim all this stuff? Um, which may in some sense be part of the answer to, to the problem. Cause you also said it's hard to predict the future, but we're creating it. So uh, I, I personally have a hard time <laughs> believing that we can't predict the future if we're actually in control of where it's heading, unless you know something, I don't know that, that we're a path is being put forth uh, before us with, without our involvement. <laughs> Uh, no, Sean, I wasn't implying that. I was simply trying to be modest. You know, futurist yeah. is already a very immodest uh, job title, uh, but it's somewhat descriptive of what I do, which is try to think about the forces that are shaping the future. And we do know a lot about those forces. We don't have the exact data and we certainly don't know the future, but we can map, well, futurists will, will describe as plausible futures and we can map them pretty accurately uh, as scenarios. So, so that's what I'm up to doing. Uh, beyond that, you know, you, you get the occasional ask for predictions. And then sometimes we offer those as well with uh, usual caveats, but they're, you know, they can be kind of fun, uh, but it's a very serious endeavor. And the, incidentally, the, the, the fun thing, the good thing about cybersecurity is that in my context, in my world, looking at all these other risks that no one cares about or that no one cares about in, in the right sort of combination, or we can get into that. I work on cascading risks. So the, the, uh, the idea that you cannot just focus on one risk because that many of them are very connected. You mentioned AI, well, AI connects with other digital technologies that connect, connect, connects with social trends and stuff. But cybersecurity is super interesting in that it is actually a defined area where business has said, there is a risk. We're taking it very seriously. We are going to establish a whole line of business around it and everybody is going to be doing this. So, you know, you, there are surprises in cybersecurity as well, for sure, right? There are things coming in from left field always, but it is one of those fields where I am confident that there is a whole industry behind it. And there's also a lot of demand for it already. So even if the risks are increasing, they are at least in some measured way being uh, already handled and people are thinking about the emerging problems or, uh, you know, opportunities, obviously also, uh, uh, for technologies. There are many other areas of technology and certainly outside technology where no one is thinking that these are connected risks. So in one sense, it's a very fortunate situation to be talking about cybersecurity. We, we know some of the risks we have seen them. They, they play out on a minute by minute basis. And that for me is goodness because there's so much data on the risk picture. There are other areas of risk where the data is more scant right. and that is far more challenging. Yeah. And that might be interesting to touch on Let me, and because I, I often look for parallels where we do something well and when we kind of miss the mark in other areas and we might have some learnings cross, cross uh, border there. But I'm interested to know, are there any areas of the future that really excite you? And this could be from a societal perspective uh, or from a commercial perspective. I am definitely very excited about how technologies uh, we will take a role in, in reshaping our world, uh, which a lot of people think is, you know, a, a world of degrowth. Uh, de and I, I kind of tend to agree with that. We are going into a world where we're going to have to take a bit more care of our surrounding environment. And that is. Uh, you know, without technology, perhaps a sad prospect of sort of like, you know, slowing down growth. But I think with uh, a, a lot of these technological opportunities, this becomes something where there are so many business opportunities to come in and actually what I would say is completing the innovation process. I think previously innovation was like, oh, you know, I'm a startup founder. I'm going to come up with something. Well, I'm a business. I'm going to have this nice new business model without thinking about the long-term effects of that business model. And it's also government's fault and everybody else's fault for sort of not saying, wait a second, you're not done with your innovation. What I'm very excited about is this new phase of innovation where we take a little bit of a longer view so that when you have innovated, meaning you have something that's either new or exciting to people or is you know, solving some interesting issue, you have to also think about what might happen 10 years after when this is perhaps successful. When is it for us a platform? 
maybe it's widespread in society. Think about if someone did that around social media, we would have had a, a, a different decade right now. Yeah. So is that, and this is fascinating to me because before we started, I, I told you that everything looks like a project to me. <laughs> it looks right. like that in my head. And when a project has a start and a finish, right? but when you're innovating, uh, it's a, it's effectively a never ending cycle. Yes. There may be points along the way or milestones, but in my experience, those, those points and milestones, when you're, you're in pure innovation mode, not delivery mode, but innovation mode, um, you're trying new things and throwing spaghetti against a wall to see if it sticks and, and trying different sauces and whatever, I'm using food analogy here, but we, we tend to not constrain ourselves with an endpoint, and we trend, tend to not constrain ourselves with this business model. We'll try this business model with this product or this innovation. We'll try another one with this, the same product and innovation. So my point is we, we like to try things and, and iterate on those trials. And therefore it's hard to kind of see where things might end up. I don't know if you have any insight on, into that or if I'm no, I, I agree. And, you know, I'm not going to take away the innovators or founders uh, desire to, to innovate or any, anybody else who innovates. That's a great endeavor. I've been very supportive of it. I've worked with thousands of startups in fact, uh, to help them connect with business and, uh, and, and clients and, and other things. So when I was at MIT and other places and as, a, and as an investor, but, uh, I, I think that sometimes it's different people that just has to have that role, right? What I'm just saying is the innovation process is much longer than we previously thought about that. And what you're talking about, the spaghetti at the wall kind of thing, that is one aspect. It's actually also not the only way to innovate. There are more systematic ways to, uh, to innovating. There's uh, basically validation based innovation now that, you know, is practiced in the best large companies. And what that means is instead of sort of having this like, uh, you know, finger up in the air, looking at where the wind is blowing and then try to innovate, uh, that way you, you go out to startups and to other sources of information and you direct your strategy, whether it's innovation or, or just new product development, you know, more mundane incremental stuff, but you, you uh, gather data from the environment right from the outside world, you need to know what stakeholders are saying about this. And we have so many more ways of gathering that, you know, uh, cyber data being one of them, you know, what is the security norm going to look like if this product is out there, right? There are so many uh, examples of, of new products that break security. You know, we don't even have to get to quantum. You can go into much simpler stuff. And, uh, that's just an example, right? So the, the innovation picture is a systems thing. You, you okay. can't just escape that. You can throw spaghetti all you want, but if you want to serve a successful dish night after night, you know, and be a successful restaurant owner in, in, in this technology space, you, you have to cater to more than just the spaghetti and wall. You actually have to cater to the need. So I guess the, I don't know if I'm going to stick with the analogy or not, but I guess the, the point I want to kind of have a, a discussion around is the, the, the concept of the data. Right. So right. we're, we're blessed and maybe cursed with having a ton of, ton of data. So I love that you said innovation, if it's driven by data and systematically, uh, pursued and, and, and has a, a more formal stance to it can actually pull in risk information, including, including cyber risk, including, uh, ESG risk and other things that, that organizations are, are faced with these days. So do you have experience where organization, you said some of the larger ones are doing this, but do, do you have an experience you can share where companies are innovating secure by design, if, if I could call it that? Well, I think Bosch is one of those examples. A colleague of mine, we were actually working on uh, you know, a project together, uh, you know, to describe that if he has longstanding, uh, relationship with them and worked with them and, and there are other companies, but just to take one. So, you know, they're a German technology company and, and what they do really is, uh, they have realized that in order to spin out startups or, or ideas, really, sometimes they're not startups, but they're innovation concepts. They need the systematic feedback that they can get from dealing with, 
uh, other innovators. So they have put that into a system who's hiring, right? I guess my colleague uh, calls it innovation and that validation driven stra strategy. And, and it's information about the risks in the environment. And I think, you know, very often we think of risks as a negative thing. It's like something that stops us from doing something, but actually risk information can be really, really positive. You can save an enormous amount of resources. If you know that you need to foreclose one avenue or one type of product and go for something else. So Barsh, I guess, is an example of a company that realizes that at their size, it makes much more sense to validate and test and, you know, kill certain ideas at earlier stages uh, than it does to, to use the spaghetti at the wall model of innovation. So I guess the larger the company, the more that makes sense, but you still have to innovate. So, you know, you do have to change your culture. This is not saying innovation is not going to happen and you can't mandate this sort of stuff. So you have to allow for a lot of experimentation. Uh, people are innovators. I mean, you know, the model at, uh, at Google X where they kind of are still sort of employees of, of, of Google, even they, uh, if they are working inside of X all the way until somebody says, okay, now we are a startup. So they are sort of in this like isolated innovation space and you, it's important to protect that space. So I, I don't discount that. And I think, you know, Bosch and other large companies uh, that understand innovation, they, they do both. They let there be a time for experimentation, but they also realize that within the bounds of what makes sense for us, we need to test it against the market, test the demand, test the risks, and we need to gather that evidence and then make a, a, a validated opinion. Does it make sense for us to go forward? Or maybe it makes sense, but not now. We need to test more. So I think, again, you know, it's innovation is both fast and slow. And the, you could, if you're really doing radical innovation, you can't just go fast and break things. That is, I think, an outdated view of innovation. And I think one that tested through time, I think we will realize that many of those uh, innovations modes that were so typical in the early digital era, they, they don't work for one, when you have hardware involved, they don't work when you have people involved and, and, and you bet there's a lot of people in hardware out there in business, right? So you can't just run around and break things, for, you know, in a garage and you're dealing with real things. So this book augmented lean back there, you know, that's about manufacturing innovation. And, and there the specter is, you know, robots taking over, is that good or bad? Well, it's good for efficiency, but you know, it's not all that great unless you are doing exactly what the robots do, do best. And then you are augmenting to that point, you're augmenting the humans in the process. So, so much of digital innovation manufacturing has actually to do with, uh, being lead. And that means augmenting the people working, uh, you know, on, on problems with the digital technologies. Yeah, and sometimes it's uh, coordinating things with robots and, and, and other technologies, but not always. Yeah. And, and the, you know, the human in the loop is, I think, going to be pretty interesting even in the next decade. Yeah. Plus and it's safer. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, humans have our, well, we have our problems, but we do have our problems. Generally, you know, our problems. I think a nice balance there is, is a good strategy. I don't know what the ratio is yet, but uh, maybe that changes over time. And perhaps we'll come back to that because I'm interested in in the, the role of technology and in, in, in identifying and mitigating risk, uh, specifically cyber and, and security operations. Um, but I want to maybe stick with one point on this innovation first, because you, you talked, and I'm gonna look at this in the context of risk. You spoke to cascading risk and you described Bosch basically having a system view if I'm uh, paraphrasing this correctly, a system view where there's innovation and it, with the goal of feeding the broader system. And to me that says there, and we know this with microservices and a, everything's API driven and, and uh, we're building systems of systems and a lot of the innovation comes in, in how multiple parts come together to achieve things that is impossible with individual parts on their own. So to me, there's complexity or opportunity with systems of systems, but then complexity, which adds risk, who's looking at the connected system of systems to see where things might fail. And then you have, uh, I don't know if it's up and side or back down again, the, the cascading risk 
<laughs> that you alluded to earlier. So there, there's kind of three parts here, and I don't know. I mean, this each one could be its own podcast, I presume. But any, any thoughts on those three things? Well, I certainly have uh, some thoughts on systems. I think the challenge with the systems metaphor, because that's really what it is, right, is that the moment you start saying the word system, you have kind of admitted that you know less than you really did at the outset because it's, and then so the word complexity comes in because it's essentially what, when you say system, you are kind of implying something that I don't fully understand that somehow runs automatically and autonomously from me. So you're sort of saying we are part of it but we can't fully control it. We just real it's more of a statement of realizing we are in the midst of something moving. That's essentially what you mean when you say system. And then you yeah. try to describe it, obviously, with simplified models. Um, but uh, cascading risk refers to this idea that if you think about risk as like single factor issues that you have to worry about, and you know, historically for me, right, it would be nuclear risk, right? The biggest risk of all, post-war, we're worried that the world will end because someone's going to push the wrong button. And, and you know, the world could have probably almost ended. So this was real. Um, nowadays, however, there's many more risks that deserve that status. There's at least three or four that deserve to be on almost equal uh, status with, with nuclear bio risks. Think about, you know, pandemics, but also even worse, you know, synthetically created pandemics that are potential uh, future developments here, you know, lab leaks and things, or, or even purposeful stuff, which gets into more kind of that cyber area of, you know, bad, bad actors that are exploiting vulnerabilities, but also of course, the specter of AI as such, and whether AI in and of itself, and not so much, I think it's more again, you know, bad actors plus AI and bad actors, states and whatnot. The thing is even AI or bio risk or nuclear. In and of themselves, they're just single inputs. The cascading part is the fact that even those three working together is super scary, but think about the other 140 risks that I certainly have identified and I work with. They may not look like much, like some of them are kind of societal phenomena. Other things are, you know, business issues or the collapse of sort of governance systems. Right now, I'm really worried about the collapse of formerly advanced nation states, for example. Think about all the technology that's embedded in, whether it be Israel, you know, Russia now, even the U.S., which is showing, you know, signs of cracking, you know, in, in the foundations. What if the U.S. were to split apart, right? Where would all that technology go? You know, there are many, many things right now where if your perspective shifts from a decade to 25 years to 50 years, my, my perspective right now is 50 years, 2075. What is the world going to look like then? And if it looks different, where did all the technology go? Who owns it? Who stole it? Who has it? Which institutions are in charge? Are, are, are there companies in charge? Are those good companies? You know, is there goodness, you know, uh, or, or, or are we just looking at a, a bunch of malignant actors? And that's when cascades become dangerous because here you're looking at a set of factors. You don't know how many, some of them perhaps are just small risks. But together, they're a little bit like the river Amazon, right? They, they form a delta and they have these effects. When they're good effects, they're bountiful and beautiful like a, a river delta. When they're bad effects, they are floods and they just wash over everything and destroy. And, and that's the metaphor of a cascade. So the question is, now you have that metaphor in your head. How do you mitigate a cascade? You certainly would have to think more redirection than stop. Like it makes no sense, at least later in a cascade, you can't stop the Amazon river, right? Where, where do you begin? So you, you can maybe redirect some things early on, but once the cascade is in motion, I mean, you can only flee. Right. Yeah. Or don't be in front of it in the first place. <laughs> right. And, and that's again, to the point with risk is there are so many responses to risk. And I think you uh, in the cybersecurity community know this. There are ways to even thrive on risk. And, and that's a super exciting thought. How Think about this. The world with a higher level of risk can actually spur more innovation. Right. So if you ask me what I'm excited about, I'm excited about communicating how the threat level can spur even more innovation without 
taking irresponsible risks doing that innovation. So do you, do you feel we're doing enough innovation in the field of risk management? Or, or is, think, it a, is it an afterthought? I think risk management is, to your point, it's operational, it's short-termist, and it's good for what it is. But when faced with kind of disruptive or bigger variables changing, we need new paradigms. So then you get into the systems thinking again. And then you're a little bit stuck stuck in a loop because, you know, who do you know that's a super expert on systems? Right. Becomes very abstract, really fast, plus academia is of no help. Well, that's a little bit of an uh, overstatement, but you know what I'm saying? Academia is geared towards expertise. Okay. Systems is almost the opposite. Systems right. is geared towards a hundred different types okay. of expertise working together. And that's a whole new model. Transdisciplinarity okay. is, is really not very established. And that's what we need. So this, this brings me to a point that I think of often, maybe not in this particular way all the time, but just the, the whether it be operational, short term, longer term, looking at the big picture, 20, 30, 50 years a ahead. Um, organizations, I don't think, unless they're super big like a Bosch and, and realize that 50 years from now, in order to survive, they have to be prepared for that. <laughs> and so they make the investments along in, in some kind of mitigation as well as innovation, and maybe the two to come together and, and spin nicely, as you described it earlier. Um, but I, I don't think a lot of companies have the wherewithal to even short term deal with risk. I think, I think they have. They have, they set aside funds to put teams in place and buy some technologies and put some controls and, and hopefully reduce some exposure in the first place so that they're not overwhelming the tools and the, and the people and the processes. Um, but I don't know that an individual organization has everything they need to adequately identify and mitigate, mitigate the risks they have, cyber or otherwise for that matter. And I'm wondering, do we need... Do we need entity? I mean, like, and look at the, the the insurance space where they have data and they and they use this information to help to drive their business <laughs> uh, for insurance and reinsurance and whatnot. Um, those are people who are experts in in that data and knowing what to do with it for their business. Do we need something like that, or or are we going to continue to expect companies to have that expertise and wherewithal? I think your point to something important. We're going to need new institutions. We're also probably going to need a whole bunch of new companies that are providing that risk function. So, you know, you mentioned earlier in passing, you know, the ESG risk work, and there are plenty of ESG jobs on the market now. And they say, you know, asking for people with ES, previous ESG experience, which is kind of a pipe dream, right? Cause th those people don't exist. Uh, it, it, it strikes me that, that there's a whole industry building around that and not, not cyber risk yet. Yeah, exactly. So, but cyber risk, ESG risk, these are discrete, you know, distinct sort of risk areas where there at least is enough of an attention around the topic that there is an industry building. So, and I think there are many, many more risk areas like that. I think every business will have its risk officer, even very small businesses, because they will be either responding to other people's, other companies' risk or govern, governance risk, or they will be, uh, you know, faced with their own risks. My point though, is that that is not necessarily as scary and sad a world as some people want it to be. And, and you know, this from cybersecurity, it just, it becomes its own industry and it has its own advantages. You're, you build up a market for it and you build up expertise. Now, will every small company solve all of its long-term problems this way? I, I don't think so, but it's, I think the ecosystem approach here is, is the right one, right? You just have to be kind of in the, in the flow of information and then eventually you, you will pick up or acquire the assets needed to deal with your particular risks and they will be shifting faster than before. So you just, you need uh, monitoring. 
you need digital monitoring tools, sensors, all that kind of stuff, right? And, and we need a better system to distribute those kinds of sensor systems. Some of it is very, very digital. Other things, you know, it's human intelligence. I don't think we can get rid of that, certainly not in the next few decades. So I, I like this concept, and, and uh, especially when we start looking at systems again. Um, as an organization, we'll certainly be enabled by systems, which are updated constantly by third parties and nth parties um, as those systems get built and augmented. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, in this, in this world where we have entities and, and institutions that are responsible, or at least helping, um, let's go back to your augmented lean example, where technology has a role, maybe not a replacement uh, to solve the problem. But your view on the relationship between technology, call it robots or AI or whatever it might be um, in this space, how, how do organizations uh, or how do these institutions kind of flesh that out? I think? I think the best manufacturing firms, certainly, uh, they start with the people they already have. So they already presumably have an approach to, to lean, meaning they have simplified and, and clarified the way that the workers from the shop floor up are working together. And they realize where some of the inefficiencies are. And when they're trying to fix things, they would never start with the idea that, oh, there is some new shiny technology out there, or even there is a new shiny risk out there, whether that be AI or some hacker group or some attack that just happened. You just don't take uh, only an event-based uh, approach to it, to take a systemic approach. You say, what is this reflective of long-term? And then you develop a systematic approach. And technology is almost the last part of your answer. There obviously are efficiencies in things like digital apps yeah, on the manufacturing floor, but some of those efficiencies can be reaped by just installing a couple of sensors, maybe at each workstation and, and digitally just making the information much more available without disrupting the original work of workers. So at the, at the base level of an organization, that's really what technology can do. And it translates all the way up to knowledge workers, you know, wherever we are in an organization, whatever you do when you're implementing new routines, don't implement new routines, just, you know, or, or don't just give up gadgets, try to make sure that you respect the way people already were doing things because an individual is always part of a team. That team has a way of doing things too. So. When you think you're improving something by putting a device on the table and saying, you all use this, you may destroy something else that was even more value. And I think that goes for introducing any kind of technology that, and that is augmented lean. You, you ask the people on the shop floor or knowledge workers, you say, what exactly is your issue? And then you fix that. And if there's a technology fix for it, you put in place a technology fix. But then you monitor and you observe and you check, did I destroy something in the process? If I did, let's pull it back out. Yeah. So that's what the best organizations do. It's as little disruption and as little leadership as needed. Yeah. So I, I think that's, uh, I think that's an interesting, interesting point. And what I'd like to do if, if we can, Tron, is maybe bring that home for security leadership team is listening to this and, and maybe their business leader partners. Um, I mean, cause we're, we're talking very abstract, uh, scenarios for very large companies and not every organization has the, has the resources to, uh, to go as wide and big as, as some of the things we've talked about here. So how, how can a security team innovate their security program, let's say. So security leaders, what, any thoughts for how they can take some initial steps to, to apply some of the things that you've learned and experienced over time in this space? Yeah. If we just pick a uh, backup on augmented lean, I think, you know, anytime you're either looking at trends, technology trends or otherwise, or you're looking at, uh, picking up technology that's going to give you more efficiencies. 
just stop for a second and, and realize that if you're chasing the technology in and of itself, that's the wrong thing to chase. There's always going to be a plethora of possible technologies you could invest in. They, they might all give you an incremental advantage. However, most of them, if you don't do it right, will actually just give you trouble, bureaucratic trouble. So, you know, think about what the problem is you're trying to solve. And if you cannot do that with your own resources, then, you know, look widely at what other peers in the industry or, or, or indeed at universities, what, what's coming down the pike and then test it out in small portions. There's a reason why we pilot things, right? So I think this goes, whether it is implementing advanced AI algorithms in, in cybersecurity programs or inside of your protocols in, in your little company, that could be a great idea. But it might also be that not being the first adopter of these kinds of things is, a, is an even wiser move. Interesting. Nid, any thoughts on having existing technologies and, and using what you know to make a different or perhaps better system? Well, any system can always be simplified. That's almost like a, an axiom of, of systems studies, right? Because a system is only looks advanced, but the, the whole idea of a system is that there are rules. And once you discover those and discover how the system really works, most efficient systems, they are efficient for a reason. It's because they have found, the system itself has found the most useful way to operate in order to carry out the functions it needs to, to grow and thrive. So if you discover the true rules of a system, they are actually not as complicated as kind of systems theory wants it to be. So my uh, recommendation really in chasing, you know, don't, don't chase complexity, change, uh, chase the, the simplicities and uh, embrace those opportunities to make little incremental improvements because those are probably the ones that will benefit your company the most in the long term. Yeah, especially as uh, these systems have been built over years, decades even. <laughs> have, have some of them stuff, have yeah. some legacy to them, right? Yes. And there's a, there's a benefit to getting rid of legacy, don't get me wrong. But the problem is when you're in the middle of it, you never think of it as legacy. And that's a real warning sign. And if you are an older company, you know this. In the 80s, what do you think they thought about mainframes? They were fantastic. They were thought of as, you know, this is obviously massive innovation. The fact that we can start having them in-house, we used to have to go somewhere and buy compute power from some institution. And now suddenly you can have, you know, a big computer in your company's basement. That was an improvement. So any technology at any given point that is kind of state of the art, it, it obviously doesn't start out as legacy. However, even what we think of today as state of the art, uh, you know, cyber algorithms and programs and vendors, you know, they are going to have to change faster than before and, and they will be legacy. So there are some insurance policies against that, right? Standardization, openness, interoperability, um, not putting all your eggs in one basket, working with a, you know, a broad set of vendors, all that kind of stuff, but eventually it will be legacy, <laughs> no matter how advanced we think it is. Right. And even if it's new today, it's legacy tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm sorry, Tron, but I, I'm going to take full advantage of having you on the show. I have another thought that's crossing my mind here. It's related, of course, but you, you spoke to setting, I don't remember if you said exactly time, but things, maybe time, money, resources, people, thought processes, energy <laughs> aside to innovate and experiment. And I'm wondering, my perspective is that some organizations do that through threat intelligence and threat hunting and, and threat research and things like that. And I, I know a lot of the SOC analysts do use tools and do some coding to maybe help improve some of the processes in their reduce some of the MTT, MTTX uh, measurements that they're held, held accountable to. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how 
cyber innovation might look that is not too big to bite off, but also not too focused that you're not really solving anything? Well, I think cyber innovation, like all innovation, is a process where you have to be in touch with some, you have to have some data to base it on. You can't just, like we said initially, you can't just kind of dream up scenarios. So you stay pretty close to where the data sources are that you have access to. Um, so I, I think that's just n number one rule. Um, and then I, I guess, you know, the cyber field, like, like other fields, we were talking about AI before, and it's very, very easy to, to jump to that domain and say, well, you know, all, everything that's innovation is going to come from that source. I think that is a too bold bet. So I guess my advice would be whenever there is a leading contender to a new sort of platform technology that's going to take over everything, that may be true. And, and if you ignore it, you're obviously in trouble. But what if it isn't true? And, and look at the past. So many technologies that were viewed as very promising, there was at least a big spin on them. And if you were the first adopter, you may have learned a lot experimenting with it. So you innovated. There's nothing wrong, right? You le always learn when you innovate. And as my book over there, Disruption Games, basically, you know, failure when properly understood has so many lessons. So I'm by no means saying don't innovate. But when you innovate and you truly accept the risk of failure, if you then do fail, make sure that you don't step too quickly aside from that failure. I think there's a lot more to be learned from failure uh, than, than we realize. And then we want that more than that's comfortable also. So innovation is about not embracing the failure, but once you have failed, figuring out very, very deeply, doing a postmortem analysis of what went wrong, why did it go wrong, what can we do here the next time? Not so that you will never fail again, but so that you can figure out um, some lessons. And it's not just about speed. Innovation and speed seem to be super closely related, mm. but I find that innovation and speed are not as closely related. And there are many, many other aspects to innovation that we will see in the coming decades had a lot more to do with innovation, data, yeah. uh, people fit with your existing <laughs> system products, right? These are much more innovation than, uh, uh, and, and much more important to innovation than speed to speed to market or speed to crazy new idea. Right. And, um, do you, do you think there's a role for, uh, nonprofits and government in this, or do you think it's going to be completely driven by commercial? Oh, no, I'm a big believer in governance, but I don't think governance is something that only governments should be doing, right? I'm a, I worked for several years in standardization in Europe uh, and uh, at Oracle at an IT company. And I think standardizing your interfaces is a insurance policy for longevity. And that's something, it's a governance function. Governments should do it by all means, national standards, extremely important for security and other things, but private sector in the digital space, certainly, and, and also in the hardware, uh, space specifically, good standards, like think about the container standard, right? Without that, what, you know, we already have a supply chain crisis. Can you imagine we didn't have standardized containers? You know, the Suez and Panama canals would be mm -hmm. even more of, of a chaos than they are right now. And that translates into the digital space. Right, that the new Panama Canal is something to do with uh, secure transmission of information. Yeah, I immediately we went to have... Kubernetes. <laughs> so you said that. Yeah. I, realize, I realize. Obviously, you're talking about the, the physical. Uh, yeah, but it could be stuff. those containers yeah. too. I mean, the metaphor is good enough. It's it uh, you know, it's uh, store, storage containers of, of yeah. some some sort. Yeah. Well, Tron, I. I... 
clearly could uh, chat with you forever. Um, and, and perhaps you, you will join me again. We can, we can pick another topic or the same one and go deeper. Sure. Um, we'll see what, uh, see what folks have to say, or if there's something on your mind, you're, you're welcome back anytime. Um, fan fantastic conversation. Uh, I know we got people thinking today. That's for sure. Oh, I'm very happy to be on your show. <laughs> thanks a million. And thanks everybody for listening. Uh, we'll include links in the show notes to, uh, to Nick Patron and uh, links to his books as well. I think uh, there are some interesting topics and certainly some uh, inspirational and, and relevant uh, insights in those books to, uh, to help teams lead their cybersecurity practice forward with uh, innovation at the heart and uh, with risk in mind. So, Tron, uh, thanks again for joining and thanks everybody for, for listening. Thank you. Pentera, the leader in automation security validation, allows organizations to continuously test the integrity of all cybersecurity layers by emulating real-world attacks at scale to pinpoint the exploitable vulnerabilities and prioritize remediation towards business impact. Learn more at pentera.io. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Security Podcast. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.